Professor, Professor Yohai Kaspi of the Weizmann Institute uh, to our seminar here in Athens. Um, Professor Kaspi is uh, a leading planetary scientist uh, specializing in uh, and his work is mainly directed towards understanding the, the atmospheric dynamics of uh, uh, planets. He has worked sort of in the general circulation of the Earth. He has done work in uh, general circulation of the outer planets, the gaseous planets, and also the exoplanets. Um, he obtained his PhD from MIT in uh, 2008 and uh, then moved on to Caltech for a postdoc for a couple of years. And in 2011, he returned back to Israel, where he is from then at uh, the Weizmann Institute and uh, presently a professor there, and also director of the Helen Kimmel Center of, for Planetary Science. Uh, he's a leader uh, in uh, the field of uh, gravitometric inversions um, of, of the missions of Juno and Cassini in, uh, in Jupiter and Saturn, uh, from which they, we were in position to, to get an understanding and a feeling through his work of uh, the inner uh, structure of the circulation of the outer planets and the inner structure of the planets themselves. This is a very, very sort of interesting topic because uh, there is a lot of theoretical work that has been directed towards understanding the circulation of these planets. And what was missing essentially was very, very important information about the structure. So these type of observations and these retrievals that were being done by Professor Caspi uh, provide very, very important uh, uh, data for constraining uh, theoretical uh, models for um, the understanding, essentially, of these uh, planetary circulations. Um, so uh, the floor is yours, Professor Caspi. Thank you very much for, for giving us a talk here in Athens. Thank you very much, Petros, for the very kind introduction. And uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to um, talk to you all um, and be in Athens uh, virtually, at least. Um, yeah, so as Petra said, this, this talk will be about uh, understanding um, the circulation on, the, on, on Jupiter. And um, it really kind of sums up a, a series of results that we have from the Juno mission, which um, is uh, orbiting Juno, uh, Jupiter for now uh, almost eight years. And in uh, the talk, we'll be kind of showing some of uh, the highlights of, of the mission, mostly about the atmosphere, but not uh, only about our, our really new understanding of, um, of Jupiter. And, and various parts of this work were done with um, students here at Weizmann and um, partners from the Juno science team. So for those of you not, um, familiar with, with uh, Jupiter, or at least not working it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Jupiter is 5.4 um, AU uh, sun. Um, it's a giant planet, um, as I'm sure you know, 71,000 kilometers of radius at the, at the, at the equator. Um, so about 11 times larger than uh, Earth in, in radius. Um, nonetheless, it rotates really rapidly around itself um, at uh, less than, than 10 hours. Um, and we measure the rotation period relative to the magnetic field, which has a strong dipole, so we can see um, the rotation of that, um, of that dipole. And that's how we measure the rotation period, of course, on a gas planet, which has no reference um, on the surface, like, uh, say, uh, like, say, Earth. Uh, it's an oblate uh, object, much more oblate than Earth, and that's a key factor for studying the gravity. And that's why I'm mentioning it here. And of course, it's much more massive than Earth, more than 300 times the mass of Earth. I'm put here at the bottom here a picture of, of uh, Earth, just so you can kind of see the, the huge difference in size. Basically, Earth can fit right here inside the great red spot. And also, you're seeing the, the circulation here. This is actually pictures from Earth. Um, and you see the strong flow at the equator going eastward. And then there's these multiple jets at higher latitudes. Uh, this is a figure showing them. So this is uh, the wind speed relative to this rotation period that I mentioned uh, as function of latitude from the south pole on the bottom to the north pole on the top. And you can see these multiple jet streams. Okay, so if, as you know, Earth 
um, has about one jet stream in its hemisphere. On Jupiter, we have these multiple jet streams. In a simple way, you can think about the planet as just being bigger and rotating faster, and therefore it can accommodate more jet streams than, uh, than Earth. Interestingly, near the equator, it has this flow going towards the east, which is what we call super rotation. It's going faster than the, um, than the, than the planet. Now beneath that wind structure and all the winds that I, that I showed you before were just by looking at the cloud level. The clouds are mostly condensation of ammonia um, at about 0 0.7 bars. And that's basically what we're seeing when we talk about the, the flows. We don't have almost no information about what's happening beneath that, uh, that cloud level. Uh, we have some estimates and some models for what's happening in the interior, at least in, in terms of how of the static um, part of the, of the planet. And, and what you have here, you have some kind of dynamical atmosphere. So this is what we see, this kind of strong movement. There's at some, um, it has some depth. And now in this talk, I will reveal to you what is the depth. This is something that we've been able to discover with the Juno measurements. Then there's this kind of thick layer, about 10% in radius, which is molecular hydrogen. It's getting denser and denser, of course, as you go in. And then at some point, um, at about after 10% of the radius, it becomes so dense that the hydrogen becomes metallic um, just because of pressure ionization. And then this whole inner 90% of in radius is metallic hydrogen, which is getting um, denser and denser until at some point, perhaps there is a core. Um, this is something that we um, did not know before. We know a little bit more about uh, now, and I'll, and I'll talk about that, but it's really a key point uh, when people think, people thinking about um, planet formation and evolution, um, do these planets form because there's a core and then stuff accumulates around it, or, um, or you don't need, need a core. So that's also, this was a key question that Juno um, didn't answer quite, but at least is giving us some, some kind of, uh, of direction. By the way, feel free to stop me along the way. I'll be happy to answer questions if there's something um, um, that you want to ask along the way. And so the Juno mission, uh, as I mentioned, um, is really there to study the deep dynamics and deep um, features of the planet. All the missions before were equipped with various instruments just to kind of look from the outside, while Juno, um, as I'll show you, is equipped with instrumentation to look deep beneath the atmosphere and, and inward. Uh, the goals are to talk about the deep dynamics that I mentioned, the interior structure, the core question, uh, which relates to the formation and evolution of the planet, and also to study the magnetic field and magnetosphere of, uh, of the planet. Since the focus here will be about the, the, the atmosphere, although the atmosphere is not um, clearly defined because we don't have like a solid um, bottom boundary, so the atmosphere can go quite deep um, inward, um, and you can see here kind of seven orders of magnitude of what we call uh, the, the atmosphere. Basically, we probe it with five different instruments. Uh, we have a visible and infrared camera, which are looking at the, at the tops, at the, at the cloud layer, kind of like what we see from, uh, from Earth. Then we have a microwave radiometer. So it has six different channels, so basically six different antennas with different sizes, which are sitting here kind of around, um, around this um, body of, of the, uh, the, the, the body of, of Juno. And they have, these antennas are sensitive to six different temperatures, basically, which means six different depths. So basically it gives us thermal mapping of the planet at six different depths going down from about 0 0.1 bar to, um, to 1,000 bars. These are kind of, this, this is an illustration of these six different uh, channels. Um, then we, we use the, the plan, the, the spacecraft basically, um, when we, we measure um, Doppler shifts in the frequency that's sending us in, um, in, in the radio beam to study the gravity. So the gravity, um, of course, we're sensitive to mass and the deeper you go, the denser it is. So there is more, um, more mass involved. And basically this kind of measurements are sensitive from about a thousand bars downward. So it's kind of, um, it's, it continues uh, the measurements from, from the microwave. And then, as I mentioned, at some point beyond um, somewhere between 10 to the fifth and 10 to the sixth bars, we um, kick into this region of metallic hydrogen and then magnetic, um, the magnetometer, which is sitting right here on, this, on the boom, um, is giving us information from the flows 
in this in this region. So it's really kind of this suite of instruments which are giving us um, uh, ability to measure deep inside um, the planet, and I'll for different results I'll point out what kind of instrumentation we're uh, we're using. Juno was launched in uh, in twenty eleven. It went into this orbit where it came back to Earth for a gravity assist in 2013, and then spent three years in orbit, arriving uh, in Jupiter on July 4th, 2016, um, almost eight years ago now. Um, and, and since then, it's been uh, orbiting Jupiter in this uh, very unique orbit. It's a very eccentric orbit. Uh, it's a polar orbit. So it's going um, kind of like this uh, around, the, around the planet. It began with a 53-day orbit, and then I'll explain in a minute why the orbit is becoming um, less and less with time. And, uh, and now it's in a 33-day orbit. We just had orbit 60 yesterday. And you can see that the orbit is, is very uh, eccentric, and that allows to fly very close to the, to the planet. Here it's... Um, at the closest point, it's about 4,000 kilometers above the, the cloud tops. And that's, that allows us to get very precise gravity measurements and other measurements, of course. But the gravity, of course, goes like one over, over the distance squared. So you want to be as close as possible, not too close, because then you're beginning to get some drag because of, of the atmosphere. So 4,000 kilometers is the distance where you're safe that you're actually doing very, very precise um, gravity me measurements. And that sets the, uh, that sets the distance. Uh, you can see that the orbit is also um, kind of um, tilting. Um, that's because of the oblateness of the planet. So every orbit, the closest approach, is about one latitude forward. So we're getting now, after 60 orbit, we're getting um, about or at latitude um, 60 or 50 something um, at the closest uh, uh, approach. And also it's timed such that we're probing different longitudes because the, the, the planet is spinning a force. So if you have about a month between the different orbit, you can time it such that you're doing different longitudes with time. So it's really giving us kind of a 360 view of the, of the planet. Uh, so the first uh, five years where that was kind of a nominal mission and, and now we're what's in what's called the extended mission part. Um, and that in the extended mission where we've been also able to pass by um, three of the Galilean satellites, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. And the way it works is that they, of course, um, are on the, um, on the equatorial plane, and Juno is orbiting on the, on the polar, um, in a polar orbit, but it's timed such that for specific orbits, we're passing by the different um, satellites, and that gives us also a gravity assist, so that's why the orbit is getting um, faster and faster. And, um, and if it's, it's just a matter of, of timing the longitude, so that um, as you're tilting, as I mentioned, more and more, you can you pass by the satellite. So now there's are also observations of the ice satellites, which unfortunately I won't have time to um, talk um, about here. So it's it really is is a mission that um, explored the whole Jovian system, uh, if you want. And the end of the mission is currently planned for September um, twenty five, unless NASA decides to do an uh, an extension. So far, all the inst instruments are working, so there might be an, an extension. Uh, so this is a, a picture that you would see if you would be sitting um, on one of these orbits, um, looking down towards the North Pole. So the, the obliquity of, of Jupiter is really small. There's no seasons, basically. It's like three degrees. So the North Pole is right um, over here. So the Terminator is, this is what you see here. And now I'll, I'll show this movie that's going to show you what you would be seeing if you would be on a two hour, it takes about two hours to go pole to pole in this, in this very fast orbit, um, what you would be seeing if you would be looking down towards the, um, towards the planet. So this is the pole, and now we're moving towards lower uh, latitudes. You can see that it has this kind of bluish color um, towards the pole, which is unexplained. It has these vortices that you can see around there. Um, now we're going into lower latitudes, kind of the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere, and it's now it's more the familiar red and white colors that you see. Lots of vortices. Um, this is kind of the equator with these um, these colors. That was the great red spot over there, 
And now we're moving toward the southern hemisphere, and and this is um, and this is what you're seeing. Um, a little bit of enhanced color by by the NASA folks, but actually real pictures. This is real pictures, and this is what we see every every orbit. So it's it's you know it's beautiful, but I also show you the the kind of rich dynamics that um, the planet um, that um, possesses. And now you're seeing the South Pole again. You're going back to these kind of bluish colors and lots of vortices. So if you notice that the lower latitudes are dominated by these jet streams that um, I showed you at the beginning, um, while the high latitudes are dominated by this kind of sea of, uh, of cyclones and anti-cyclones. Um, this is another kind of mosaic of the, um, of the pole. Um, we have endless number of, of pictures like this, but there's a lot of science that can be done with this, studying turbulence, studying the clouds, studying the, the, the chemistry. Um, there's a, a really a very, very wide range of, of research that's been done with, with this uh, new Juno data. And, and actually lots of art. People are excited about the artistic part of uh, <laughs> this kind of thing. Uh, one of the really surprising um, results um, that emerged immediately was the fact that we have near the poles the system of, of vortices that I mentioned. So you're looking here on the left, you're seeing um, the visible uh, image. Um, so this is the pole here, and this is latitude 80, the circle here. Uh, and you can see again, as I mentioned, the obliquity is really small. So the North Pole is a little bit in the shadow, the South Pole is, is kind of in, in the light, uh, but almost no uh, seasons. On the right, you're looking at the infrared um, image, um, North Pole in the top and South Pole in the, um, in the bottom. And what you can see here is that you see this series of cyclones, <clears throat> okay, so at the pole, <clears throat> there's this polar cyclone sitting over here, and then around it are these circumpolar cyclones. A cyclone in the north will be rotating counterclockwise, so it's like this. You can see that all of these are cyclones, eight cyclones around the polar cyclone, and in the south, um, where a cyclone goes in the other way, like this, clockwise, we have five cyclones in the south. Okay, so this is kind of a, a surprising result. We never saw the poles of Jupiter because when you look from the equatorial plane, which we do from Earth observations or from any other spacecraft that was there in the past, you don't really see the poles. And this is really very close to the pole. You're talking here about latitude 80 plus. Uh, so this is not something that you can observe um, from anywhere on the plane of the solar system, you really need to be in this unique polar orbit um, to see this. So, you know, we got these observations and, and now we want to um, explain them. Uh, this is a kind of another beautiful pictures, picture from the kind of from the side. Um, you see the North Pole with these eight cyclones around, around the North. Um, yeah. Um, and I'll get to explaining those polar cyclones in a minute. This is kind of an outline. I'll kind of go in this talk um, through different regimes. I like dividing Jupiter into three. Um, a polar region, um, which is this kind of sea of cyclones and anti-cyclones that I mentioned in, in the movie. Then we have this region of multiple jets, um, and I'll show also these kind of cells that, that exist there. Um, so these are jet streams that go to the, in the east-south, east-west direction, and these are these six, six jets. Um, that I mentioned. And then um, I mentioned at the beginning, we have this kind of wider jet sitting at the equator of with this region of equatorial super rotation. So this is sitting over here. And then this all goes down to a certain depth that what we call a dynamical region. And this is something that we um, have shown that it's about 3000 kilometers. And I'll show you these, these observations. And then in the interior, it seems that there are very um, almost no flows. So that's also something that we're going to uh, we're going to get to. But let's begin with, uh, with the North Pole, um, with the polar regions. And here, as I mentioned, um, we have eight cyclones surrounding a polar cyclone in the North and five cyclones in, in the South. For comparison, I'm showing you here pictures from Cassini where we have only a polar cyclone. We have a very clear polar cyclone that Cassini saw in its inclined orbit. So it was able to see the poles, not as good as is Juno because it didn't really go over the pole, but it had some kind of an angle. So it, you could form these pictures. So this is the um, North Pole of Saturn with a strong cyclone and South Pole of Saturn with also a strong cyclone, but no circumpolar cyclones. So any theory to explain these cyclones on Jupiter 
will also need to explain the um, lack of cyclones on, on Saturn. So to do this, um, um, I'll introduce here a concept called the beta drift. And, um, and here in, in a simple way, if you think about a cyclone which is rotating like this, um, and it's sitting in a background of vorticity because of the rotation of, of the planet. So because of the planet is rotating, then the vorticity of the whole planet is increasing as you go um, forward. And if you take a blob and, and the whole, and the, there's a concept called conservation of potential vorticity, you might've heard about it. Um, I'm sure Petros talks about this a lot, uh, where basically the total vorticity um, needs to be conserved. So if our background vorticity is increasing towards the pole and we take a blob with a relative vorticity here and move it forward, then it needs to develop a negative vorticity. So it's gonna develop a circulation like this. And then vice versa, if you take a blob of fluid from here and move it here, then we'll need to develop a circulation um, in the positive um, direction. So overall, the combination of this kind of a flow and this kind of a flow is giving us a drift here, you see in this velocity, going towards the, the pole. This is a very uh, well-known phenomenon. For example, on Earth, if you think about tropical cyclones, showing you here that the Atlantic basin, and if you think about cyclones in the Atlantic, then they have this drift towards the pole. I'm, I'm sure you've seen uh, pictures like this um, in the news and in weather um, events that happen in the, in the US. Actually now, you know, Greece is getting in these recent years um, also these kind of, uh, cyclones in the, in the Mediterranean, and, um, and they're strongly affected by this beta drift effect. Okay, so leave the details away, but remember that a cyclone always propagates towards the pole, and an anticyclone has this propagation away from, from the pole. So if we now think about this polar cyclone sitting at the pole of Jupiter that we saw here in the observations, and now we think about one of these, for simplicity, just think about one of these circumpolar cyclones, then it has this force this beta drift, which is pushing it towards the pole. But the fact that we have a cyclone sitting here and the structure of the cyclone, um, which we know from, from observations, is, and I'm skipping here a little bit of technical details because I wanna just give you kind of the flavor of the things, that has a, a negative gradient in vorticity, which is giving you a force towards in the other direction. Okay, and this depends on latitude. So there is a latitude where you will be in equilibrium the beta drift is pushing you poleward, and the existence of the polar cyclone is pushing you equatorward. And one can go and calculate um, this, this latitude based on the observations that we have from Jupiter, because we have precise observations from tracking of clouds of the vorticity and the speeds and the size of all of these cyclones. And if you do this calculation and you're looking for this latitude of equilibrium, this F theta here, so when this thing would be zero, that means you're in exact balance between this force and this force and you have the latitude. Um, and you can do this calculation for Jupiter, North Pole, South Pole, and Saturn, North Pole, South Pole. And this is what you, you get. Um, again, F theta, if it's zero, that means you're in equilibrium. And you can see that for Saturn, we have no latitude of equilibrium, okay? And that's why on Saturn, we don't have any cyclones. Basically, any cyclone that's arriving and drifting forward, of course, the beta drift effect still holds, it just comes up and then just sucked into the um, polar cyclone of Saturn. But on Jupiter, because of what I just explained here with this balance, we have two latitudes of equilibrium, okay? And if F theta is negative, that means you're moving forward. And if F theta is positive, that means you're moving equatorward. But then the the equilibrium here at latitude 87 or so is not stable because anything that's moving here would be pushed, if it's negative, it's pushing forward. So it would just gonna be lost um, towards the polar cyclone. But this latitude here is stable, okay? Because again, negative values here means you're moving forward. That means you're pushed towards the pole and vice versa over here. So that means we have a stable latitude of equilibrium. And that explains why we have the cyclones on Jupiter sitting here at latitude 84. Okay, so the process is that you have kind of noise, turbulence in the system. Okay, it's a rotating system, then we're forcing cyclones and anticyclones. Anticyclones are pushed equatorward, cyclones are pushed forward, and then they reach this kind of balance, are just kind of stuck there exactly at latitude 84. Okay, so it's kind of this explains this interesting phenomena that we saw on, on Jupiter. 
Um, one can also explain why we have eight cyclones in the north and five cyclones in the south, invoking the same kind of physics. Um, if you think about some circumpolar cyclone that's surrounded by one to the east and, and one to the west, you can calculate in the same way the vorticity gradient um, like before and calculate the force that this cyclone is, is feeling. And then you can again find the latitude of equilibrium. If they would be too close, they would be kind of merging together. If they're too far, then they don't feel one another and, and then some another cyclone can, can, can kind of come in. And if you go and calculate, again, I'm leaving the details away, you find that in the North Pole, the number is about eight. In the South Taos Pole, the number is about five and a half. Okay, that means that five is very stable, but six is gonna be unstable. And then indeed, um, every now and then, for example, this is a picture from Perigee of 22, we suddenly had in the South six cyclones, but then in orbit 23, one of them disappeared. So we're, we're kind of in this intermediate. That kind of shows that this, this theory um, holds, it explains both the location and the, and the number of, of the cyclones. Um, also, if you look at them in time, uh, and you're looking here at four years of observation, so beginning uh, with year one in green, and then year two in orange, and year three in blue, and year four in red, you can see that with time, they oscillate, and they drift to the west. Um, you can see here that the oscillation spectra, that's about one year. This is the meridional spectra. So about every Earth year, and that's a coincidence because an Earth year doesn't mean anything on, on, on Jupiter, but coincidentally, every Earth year or every 12 months here, they do this oscillation um, around themselves. That's also something that one wants to uh, explain. And to do that, we're invoking the same kind of um, physics. We can, uh, we can calculate the acceleration that each cyclone is, is, is feeling based on the observation because we have their, their location every orbit. So every 53 days or 43 days, depending on the length of the orbit, we have an, an observation. And that's what you see here in, in blue. This is this kind of um, oscillations here for the... Um, for all the circumpolar cyclones and the polar cyclone, in this case of the southern hemisphere, and um, and then you can see that the theoretical value in in um, this kind of line that you see over here. So this is taking the the total force that they're they're all feeling from all cyclones. So now this is a little bit more complicated. You can think about this as a, as a, as a system of springs. This cyclone sitting over here is feeling the beta drift. So this is pushing it towards the pole. But then there are these other five cyclones, the polar cyclones, but all, cyclone that I mentioned before, but also each one of the other four is, has a rejection, of course, as a function of distance. So overall, there is a total force here to, to the side. And then this thing is causing it to do an oscillation with time. And basically this um, kind of red line here is the calculation of the combined forces that, um, that you're seeing um, over here. And, uh, and, and I'll leave it here. I just kind of want to give you the flavor of the polar cyclones. I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, we can also explain the, the westward drift, but it all comes down to these beta drift um, dynamics. And I think the nice thing about this, um, in addition to explaining Jupiter, is that on Earth, this phenomenon is really hard to, to observe. When you think about the tropical cyclones in the Atlantic or anywhere on Earth, there are so many other factors. You have the, the continents and you have the air-sea interaction and you have a lot of things um, that, that make it very difficult to do these predictions. On Jupiter, it's a very ideal system. You don't have continents. The chemistry is simple. There's no biology, no human interaction, nothing. Basically, uh, a, a gas, a, a ball of fluid rotating in space, very homogeneous. And then we can see phenomena that we understand from Earth, but we could never do such a precise prediction on Earth because... Um, because the Earth is so is more more complex, so so there is here a nice thing that we can kind of work in both ways. We take concepts that we know from Earth to Jupiter to explain things, but also isolate physics that we just cannot isolate on on Earth. Um, I'll move now to the um, to the mid latitudes, and here we're talking about these um, these jet streams. So I'm showing you here. Um, the zonal wind here, this is in black, so 
positive is eastward and negative is westward. This is the same figure that I showed you in the first slide when I showed you the winds as function of latitude. Um, you kind of see this here. Um, this is the super rotation re region, but I just want to focus now on latitudes 60 to 20, south and, and north. And then in the bottom figure um, panel, I'm showing you the momentum flux convergence. Okay, so this is convergence of eastward momentum. So basically, when you have convergence of eastward momentum, you're piling up eastward momentum. That means you're generating a flow towards the east. And when you have a divergence of eastward momentum, so you're taking away eastward momentum, that gives you a flow towards the west. And um, you can see here that this thing correlates very well with, with, with the jets. Wherever you have an eastward jet stream, here, for example, I'm showing you here at latitude 50, we have this positive um, convergence. This is the, there's a negative here. So it's a, so positive here means convergence. And wherever you have a flow towards the West, that means you have here a divergence. Okay, so this, this figure shows you, and this was known before, that the jets on Jupiter are driven by the eddies. This is similar to the mid to jet stream on Earth. Um, on Earth, we have actually two jet streams. One is called the subtropical jet stream, and one is the, one is the eddy-driven jet. But these are all eddy-driven jets, except the one near the pole. But as I said, we're focusing here just on the mid-latitudes. So this is an important thing to, to remember. Um, ah, here I'm showing you the, the Earth. So I'm talking here of something which is similar to the, this mid-latitude jet stream on Earth. You can see if I show you here a, a slice from Earth, and this is Earth observations, then wherever the red here means convergence, and that's exactly where this jet stream is sitting on Earth. While the other one where we have divergence, this is what's called a subtropical jet, which is different on Earth. So, um, and, and the reason I'm showing you the Earth example is that on Earth, we know that wherever we have an A-driven jet, we also have a cell, a feral cell. Okay, this is a cell, a circulation cell, which is going in this, in this, uh, in this direction. Okay, and the, the, the physical, the, the relevant equation is this, that if we look at the zonal momentum balance, uh, and again, not going into detail, just saying that wherever I have a convergence of eastward momentum, that means I also have a flow to the um, south direction. So if here I have the strongest convergence, that means I'm getting here a flow towards the, um, towards the equator. And that creates, that's basically what's driving this feral cell. And then one can ask, okay, so if on Jupiter, I'm seeing these a driven jets and I'm seeing this very clear momentum flux convergence, can I find such circulation cells also on Jupiter? And we could not answer this before because before we didn't have any observations beneath the, the, the top layer of the clouds, but now we do. So, I'm showing you now um, on the right, the observation. This is kind of a busy figure, so I'll go over it slowly. So I'm showing you still the zonal winds on, on top, but then now I'm showing you here the measurements from the microwave instrument that I mentioned before. So the microwave has six channels at six different depths, um, 0 0.7 bars, one and a half, three, nine, 30, and about a hundred. Um, this is the center of, it's, it's not exact um, in, in exact um, depth, but it's this is, kind of a mean depth for, for all these um, channels. And you're seeing here that in mid-latitudes, we have a very strong correlation between the signal that we're getting from uh, the microwave, which is basically the brightness temperature. And the brightness temperature um, is mostly affected by ammonia abundance. So you can think about ammonia as a tracer in the atmosphere. Um, and we're just seeing here variations in ammonia at different levels. Note that the scale here is different because um, the scale, uh, because the abundance is, gr is basically growing with, with depth. You can see this here um, on panel A here is the background um, ammonia abundance. Um, but you can see these variations that correlate exactly with where we have these momentum fluxes. And also we marked, I forgot to say in, in pink and in, in blue, wherever it goes eastward or um, or westward. Okay, so then there's this strong correlation. What does that mean? Okay, and what it means is that um, you have this tracer, and the tracer is advected up and down in the atmosphere. Okay, so that means that you have, since there's a background concentration which is not uniform, 
that means that you're advec you have more concentration and less concentration as you move with, with latitudes, which is an indication of a circulation cell, which is moving stuff up and down in the, in the atmosphere. You can see a cartoon of that uh, over, over here. Basically, if you have a background, and the colors here are the same colors that you have in the background here. If you have a background, that means that you're pulling up higher densities um, and pulling down lower densities as on both sides of this um, circulation cell. It's slightly more complicated because as you see here, the background gradient actually flips, um, but it all works out. You can see here that the, um, there's a flip also between say channel four or three here and channel five um, because the background is flipping. And um, actually that gives us a really strong indication that indeed we're seeing advection of this background um, tracer. Of the, of the material. You can see here, for example, in the bottom, where you're going from a, um, more ammonia to less ammonia, that means that you're getting, gonna get a positive anomaly and that's what you get over here. And then in this level here, where you're going from, a, from less to more ammonia, um, illustrated here in panel C, that means you're gonna get a reversal. So this, for example, here is upward. And if you, oops, and if you follow, this goes um, downward over here, okay? so this is giving us, this is another discovery that we have these circulation cells on Jupiter, which, is, which are actually similar to what we have on Earth. This is a picture of Earth here. So we have three cells, um, one called Hadley cell in the tropics, feral cell and polar cell. And on Jupiter, we have an equivalent feral cell, which is around the A-driven jet, around the mid-latitudes. But instead of just having one, we have about eight of these in each, in, each, uh, in each hemisphere, which we see clearly in the observations that, that I showed you before. Um, and this is kind of a slice kind of to illustrate what we're seeing on, on, on Jupiter. I am not talking yet about the tropical region or the low latitude region here and the equivalent feral cell. That's a, that's a separate thing. Uh, and you can see this here in this movie here where you have the jets. Now we're opening up the planet, we're peeking in. So, um, again, focus just on the mid latitudes. Wherever you have a flow towards the east, we have a circulation cell in the counterclockwise direction and a flow towards the west, a counterclockwise direction, exactly corresponding to this relation between the momentum flux convergence and the north south direction. And this is kind of peeking in into each one of these uh, circulation cells. So, this is also kind of a major discovery of what's happening between the cloud level, um, um, how is the circulation? But then the biggest question is, how far did this go? Okay, so I'm kind of ending the simulation at the point where I ended the MWR measurements, the, magnet, the microwave, but then how deep are these flows going? So for that, we're doing um, our gravity experiment. Uh, so here we're, um, as I mentioned before, we're using the spacecraft as basically our instrument. So the spacecraft is sending us a radio beam to Earth, and on Earth, we're measuring um, variations in frequencies. So this is basically a Doppler um, kind of experiment, and this variation in uh, frequency allows us to see if the spacecraft is accelerating or decelerating as it's going around the planet, and therefore measure um, the gravity field. And we can do this very, very um, accur accurately, um, about seven orders of magnitude smaller than the kind of the background gravity field of, um, of Jupiter to the level of um, uh, fractions of, of uh, milligauss. Um, and the way we treat the gravity field is that we um, look at the gravity harmonics. So for those not familiar with this, basically we're looking how density is distributed and present this in terms of um, Legendre poly polynomials, these P sub n's that, that you see over here. And it's an integrated measure of, of the density. So for example, if we think about the even harmonics, which are representing uh, something which is symmetric north and south, then um, these are the Juno measurements here in red. Um, since this is a log plot that I'm putting in, in full color, um, a positive number and then open a negative number, which should not mean much um, if it's positive or negative at this point. But what you see is you see a decay in, in this, um, and this is the black is the Juno kind of sensitivity. Um, until recently. And, uh, and you see basically a decay in the gravity. And to give you some intuition to this, um, J2 um, is basically measuring the oblateness. If you think about 
Legendre polynomial too, right? It had this big belly um, around around the, the, the equator or, or in, kind of in the middle. And therefore the biggest signature by, you see two orders of magnitude in this log scale is from J2 and then the gravity harmonics decay um, as you go to, to higher harmonics. Now, interestingly, Juno measured also odd gravity harmonics. So these are these four numbers that you see over here, J3, five, seven, and nine. Three of them are negative and one is, is positive. And this is, was a somewhat surprising result because that means that something is asymmetric on this planet. As I mentioned, it's, it's just a big ball of gas rotating in space. Um, and the whole interior structure is completely um, symmetric. There are no mountains. There are nothing that can break um, the, the symmetry. Um, but what is not symmetric is actually the wind structure. So here again, I'm showing you the winds. These are these six jets as function of latitude and uh, the super rotation here. And you can see um, how these um, winds are indeed not symmetric. We have positive values in the north and negative values in, in the south. Um, so if we see any kind of asymmetry, it's, this is an indication of the wind. And then you can say, so the deeper the winds, they contain more mass, and therefore they can give you um, a gravity signature here. So if you, can, if you can get some kind of a relation between the wind strength and the gravity, then the deeper the flows, then you can get an indication for how deep you are. The deeper the flows, um, the higher the signature that you're going to get over here. Okay, so how do we build this relation between the wind strength and, and, the, and the gravity? Um, we use what's called the thermal wind balance, and this is a known balance to Earth on Earth. Basically, it relates between density gradients in the, in the atmosphere and the wind shear. Okay, so if you take this kind of wind structure and we project it inward in this cylindrical nature, and I'll show later why we do this in cylindrical nature, um, and then we can get some kind of a decay, let's say in the simplest way, some kind of exponential decay. So you get a picture like this, and then we invoke this relation between wind and density and get the density anomalies. And then you can integrate the density to get the, the, the gravity. Now, for those not familiar with thermal wind balance, um, I can explain it later, but I think for the purpose of this talk, you can um, believe me that in the, in the atmosphere for a rapidly rotating planet, um, we have a relation between the wind structure and how density um, varies. So if you go and do this exercise, you can give a prediction for what will be the gravity anomaly. I'm showing you here on the right, the odds harmonics, J3, 5, 7, and 9. On the left, J6, 8, and 10, the even gravity harmonics, as function of depth. Okay, assuming this exponential decay um, that I mentioned before, we don't know that the flow is decaying exponentially. We actually know it's not, but just as a simple exercise, let's, let's, let's assume that. Um, and then you can give a prediction for what will be the gravity anomaly as a function of the depth of the flows. If they're very weak or, or very shallow, that means we're gonna get small values that may not be detectable because it's just too shallow. But if the flows are going to depth of tens of thousands of kilometers, then it contains enough mass and therefore we get here the bigger values that we see, um, that we see over here. So this was, 10 years ago, this was a prediction that, that we gave. And then uh, seven years ago, we finally got um, the measurements. Uh, and these are the four values that you're seeing here for um, J3, five, seven, and nine. And these are the measurements from, from Juno. And you can see that they're all in the same neighborhood. So all, even though this is a very simple model, just decaying exponentially, taking the cloud level flow that we see at the surface, decaying exponentially inward, you can see that we all, we get values here which an order of um, between 1,000 or 3,000 kilometers um, that in, in this region over here for all four harmonics. So these are four, let me emphasize, these are four independent measurements and all of them tell you that the flow goes several thousand kilometers um, deep, for example, uh, and it gives you the correct um, sign. Like we didn't know if it's gonna be a positive or a negative um, number. So the likelihood of getting this, this, this right without having a relation to the physics is, is not, very, um, not very high. And similarly, you can see that the even harmonics, um, which is slightly more complicated because they also contain a component because from the solid body part that I mentioned, but they also give you values of several thousand um, kilometers. 
And you can do more complicated exercises with allowing the flow to be various shapes, doesn't need to decay exponentially. This is kind of a summary of, 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 of that and telling you that this is the vertical profile of the flow going kind of decaying down. So if at the surface, it's whatever value that we see at the cloud level, as it decays down, it decays at about 3000 kilometers, okay? So which is roughly 100,000 bars. It, um, it goes towards uh, zero. And this is the latitudinal profile of that flow. This is kind of the optimized solution that we can, we can do. Um, and this is what we had until five years ago or so. Um, but now we have better measurements. We have now 60 orbits. Um, so what I showed, uh, taking the same intuition that I hope I, I just gave you, but now we can calculate much the gravity harmonics to much higher precision. Okay, so now we have, um, we can go all the way to that to J40. Okay, and in black um, is the observation. Okay, it has some constraints on it, but let's think about the black as the observation, giving us this interesting oscillation that we see here. And then in, in red is our thermal wind solution. This is the, the theoretical solution that you would predict with what I just showed you. Okay, so I showed you now, I showed you before J3, 5, 7, and 9, but you can see that it works actually to really high harmonics. Okay, so you would not, I mean, so that means that the theoretical model, if it's predicting 40 numbers correct, that's, you know, it's like winning the lottery. That means you have a correct theory for, for, how, it's, uh, for how it's working. But we can do now more. We can understand more about, about this because of this kind of um, oscillating shape of the, of the measurement, which we, which we can now, um, which we now explain. Um, and also we can explain now why, you know, we saw, um, we had three negative numbers and one positive number, three, five, and nine were negative, seven was positive. Before I told you, we can't really know, but now we can see that it's all part of this oscillation pattern. So let's explain why we get this, um, this kind of um, oscillation. Um, before I do that, we can also experiment by saying, let's now say the winds are not going in in a cylindrical fashion. Let's say they're going in radial, and then you can see that we're completely off. We have no correlation uh, whatsoever. So basically meaning, so this is basically giving a strong indication that the winds are indeed going in in a cylindrical fashion, which was postulated, as Pestorus mentioned at the beginning, years ago, but now we have observational evidence that this is indeed the, the case. So where does this wavy pattern come from? And I'll, um, mm -hmm. I think I'll... Yochai, is that everywhere? I mean, this, uh, is that global or is it uh, for a specific uh, latitude? This, um, this, the measurement? Train the flow everywhere or just in, in specific areas of the, of the flow? No, this is the gravity signature of the whole planet. So how so are you, are you arguing that the depth is 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 uh, is cylindrical all along all along the whole planet? Yes. Okay. And and I'll and I'll explain in a minute why. Um. So if if you think about um you know if if you have say a delta function and you're looking um how it projects on uh, in in uh, in uh, wave number space then it, it gives you this kind of an oscillation. And if you make the delta function a little bit wider, that, that controls, um, that controls the, the kind of decay of this wave. And this is exactly what I'm arguing we're seeing here. Um, so in panel A, I'm showing you the winds in black. This is the same profile that I showed you before. And um, in the bottom panel, I'm showing you the gravity signature of, of, of that. Now let's do a simple experiment and let's assume all the winds are zero, okay? except this blue region over here, like in the question here, but so just at one, at a specific latitude around latitude 21 or say, we have this one jet. You can see um, this race, this delta function I just mentioned, that you have an oscillation um, that's very similar actually to the full measured oscillation that we just, um, we just mentioned, okay? So this is kind of saying that this latitude is really important in setting um, our flow. Moreover, let's, we can do a, a thought experiment and take this jet and shift it a little bit forward in green here, or a little bit equatorward in red, and also calculate what's going to be the gravity signature of that. And you can see that that changes the phase and the frequency, and it doesn't really match uh, well with, uh, with observation. OK, 
Okay, so this kind of hints that this specific latitude is really important in our gravity um, signature. This is this strong jet, remember this asymmetric jet at latitude, um, latitude 20. Um, and also if you take a little bit more care and you also look at this jet over here and do the same kind of exercise, um, you can see that actually the south jet contributes about a third um, to the measurement. So you can get a better match of the jet measurement if you take the blue one here and the orange one here. But then you don't really need all these ones or all these ones or the equatorial one. So that basically gives you the gravity signature. What does this tell us? Where does this come from? Um, I'll show that in the next slide. Just to show you that if we also change the depth, that changes the amplitude of the wave here. So you can see 3,000 roughly matches the gray points, which are the measurement. But if we make it much shallower in blue or much deeper in um, green, um, then we're missing. So this is an indication that 3,000 is really the depth of the dynamics here. Okay, so again, why that these specific jets are important. Um, let's think about, this is a slice of, to the planet and you're seeing here the winds in orange. This is the magnitude of the of orange and blue, the positive and negative values of the, of the winds over here. And let's, let's focus on this region here and divide it into three, an equatorial region, a region around this latitude 21 jet that I showed is important, that was the blue one, and then a region to the, to the, to the north. Why in region two, okay, here, you have a very strong jet. Okay, this is, again, in blue are the winds, and this is how much mass is involved. Okay, so obviously when you're at the equator, and if you're on a cylindrical projection, you have no mass involved, right? Because at the equator, you're basically have, you're not slicing through the planet. If you go to high latitudes, you have, you're slicing through the planet, but there is, the circumference is smaller. So also you have less mass involved, and therefore there is a specific latitude where it has the most mass um, uh, mass involved here. So in this region too, we have both a strong jet and it's penetrating deep enough to involve enough mass and therefore it's, it's important. When you go to high latitudes, we have these jets, but they're weak. So even though they go pretty deep, since the jets are small, they don't have a big enough signature on the, on the gravity field. And if you go towards the equator, we have this really strong jet over here. But because of the cylindrical projection, it doesn't reach deep enough to contain enough mass. And therefore, um, it's not important in the, in the dynamics. Okay, so to answer the question that was just asked, by these gravity measurements, we know that these two jets are important. That tells us that the projection is cylindrical. If it would have been not cylindrical near the equator, then th this jet would contribute to the gravity measurements. So, so that's kind of an indication of why this is kind of observational evidence that the flow is going along cylinders and not going in the radial um, direction. Uh, I see it's getting um, late, so I'll just take, can I take five more minutes? Yes, of course. Okay. So strengthening this kind of evidence is measurement that we had from the Cassini mission um, seven years ago and Cassini which was the orbiter of Saturn in the very last part of the mission went into what's called the grand finale, where it went into this special orbit that's kind of like the Juno orbit going between the planet and the rings. So it's giving us very precise gravity measurements as it's kind of sneaking between the planet and, and the rings. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the analysis, very similar to what I show you now for Jupiter, just showing you the, the results. So on Saturn, um, we find that the flow is, goes much deeper. So nearing 10,000 kilometers versus 3,000 kilometers on Jupiter. This is the same profile I showed you before, kind of flipped on, on the side, where for Jupiter, this is depth. This is the strength of the flow in the X direction. So we have a decay profile with some uncertainty. And then on Saturn, this is the decay profile. So much more mass is involved. If on Jupiter, we had this kind of flow structure, which you can barely see it here on, in this, when you look at the full planet. On Saturn, it's much deeper, going like 15% um, versus just a few percent on Jupiter. So why is this happening? Okay, and, and I'll show you why is this um, consistent. Saturn is three times less massive, although it has nearly the same radius as Jupiter. Okay, so to reach the same kind of pressures, you need to go much deeper, about three times deeper. Um, and 
if you look at the electrical conductivity, this is, has to do with the magnetic field. And there's various theory of that what's stopping the flow at some point is when you reach this kind of region where the conductivity um, is, is growing. If you look at values of conductivity, you can see that on Jupiter, they rise right about 3,000 kilometers. These are independent measurements. And on, on Saturn, it's at about 10,000 kilometers. Okay, so this factor of three comes in, and, and this is understandable just because the fact that Saturn is less dense, and therefore you need to go deeper to reach um, the same values of, of, uh, of conductivity. So this gives us kind of an, an indication um, that these gravity measurements are not only self-consistent, but they're also the ones for Saturn um, are consistent with what we see for, um, for Jupiter. Um, also, if you think about the equatorial flows, um, this kind of super rotation reading region on Jupiter, it hits, it stops at about latitude 13. This is kind of the projection um, of 3000 towards the outside. And on Saturn, it reaches about latitude 33. This we know from observations, but it also it matches the fact that if you go down 10,000 kilometers and project upward, you reach the same kind of latitude. So this is giving us kind of a consistent picture um, for Jupiter and for, uh, for Saturn. Um, just to mention another cool result that we did with gravity is flying over the Great Red Spot. So this spot has been, you know, a mystery since ages ago and, and this kind of anti-cyclone that's sitting in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we had two dedicated flybys over it and we managed to measure the gravity signature of this. So basically you're flying over a mass anomaly and you're sensitive enough um, to measure the, anom the anomalous mass between the cyclone and the surrounding, or the anti-cyclone and, and, and the surrounding. And again, the stronger this gravity signature, the deeper, the more mass is involved. And we've been able to put constraints, which I'm not gonna go here into details, but we've been able to put constraints on that cyclone saying it's about 500 kilometers deep, or not more than 500. That means that, um, um, you know, it's very deep, but compared to the 70,000 radius, it's still a very, very shallow feature, like, you know, in American terms, it's a pancake. Um, and, and also we can, we can see it here in the microwave observation. So we, we know it goes down to um, several hundred bars um, or to 350 kilometers from microwave. And we know it's not more than 500 from, from the gravity. Um, um, I'll leave, this is about the interior structure. Uh, I'll leave it um, for questions if you want to ask. I'll just say that Juno has been able to really, really tighten up um, the phase space of, say, this is J4, J6, which tells us about the interior structure. And, and what we can say now, um, again, this, these are references if you're, if you're interested in that. Uh, we can say now that Jupiter has no core. So there is no solid core, or maybe there is one, but it's really, really tiny, say a few, up to six or maybe 10 Earth masses. Um, what's happening in the interior is what's called more, it's kind of more a dilute or fuzzy core. It's a more continuum um, of material, of heavy material towards um, this uh, region over here. You cannot find solutions. So people are doing these kind of 1D models where they're constraining them by these J2, 4, 6, 8 that I mentioned um, before and the shape of the planet and the upper temperature, you cannot find solutions that match these very, very exquisite um, Juno observations um, with invoking a full-size core as was uh, thought before. And you need this, what's called this kind of dilute core. Uh, okay, so I gave you a brief overview of a lot of results. Um, I hope I didn't tire you guys. Um, we talked about the polar cyclones. Um, we explained this um, neat phenomena that we see in the, at the poles. We talked about the mid-latitudes, why we have the jet streams, and also show that they're surrounded by these multiple um, circulation cells. We talked about the gravity field and how it allowed us to constrain the depth of the, of the flows that we see um, from the outside on Jupiter, and we never knew how deep they go. But also, we've been able to kind of show that these flows are oriented in a cylindrical um, direction and not in a, in a radial um, direction. And also that's consistent with results that we have on Saturn, where there the planet is three times um, lighter and therefore um, um, less dense as you go in, and therefore the flow um, halts deeper down than it does on Jupiter, all being very consistent. I mentioned the, the Great Red Spot and, um, and, the, and the interior. 
and I'll leave it now for uh, for questions if if you guys want. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was uh, an excellent talk, and I believe there will be questions uh, because you covered many topics. So feel free to raise your hands. There's also virtual clapping. <clears throat> I mean, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. I mean, you are the expert here. <laughs> uh, uh, Johai, uh, um, from, have you gotten any sort of new information about the um, the certification of the interior? Uh, With 